Awesome. How are you guys feeling after tubing today? Uh, exhausted, tired, a little sore. Um, leaders, how are you feeling after tubing today? <laughs> Jared, how how is this, how are you today? Yeah. <laughs> so I <laughs> yes, Asher is a few inches shorter thanks to me. Um, but. Yes, we all had a great time tubing, um, but I think we're all kind of hitting that I just went tubing for three hours, I've eaten tacos, and we're hitting that lull. We're starting to get tired. Um, and I think leaders, we are more uh, as being a little bit older, a little bit grayer, and uh, not as quick to rebound, say, so to speak, from um, spending this much time doing a surprisingly physical activity of tubing. Um, we get the sense of our bodies are tired. Our bodies are exhausted. They have been worn down in a way. Um, and so that's kind of something that I think is atypical for you guys in middle school. You're not often really exhausted, really worn out. Um, by tomorrow, you guys will be back full go, ready to go as Amir's teaching at Plants and Pillars while Charlie's going to be sitting on a stool teaching classroom uh, at the 9 a.m. Um, and Amir is going to be praying for just enough energy for the 11 a.m. service. Um, we have this sense as we get older that our bodies are starting to break down. The things that we could do um, when we were your age, we can no longer do without more severe consequences, so to speak. Um, our backs don't quite recover in the same way. Our joints feel it as we head down the stairs. Um, and so we have this sense, I think, as we get older that our bodies are wasting away in a way. Um, and that's something that Paul is talking about in this verse. And that's something that I don't think you guys as middle schoolers necessarily identify with. Maybe a little bit as you've worn out, you've been worn down tubing, but you'll bounce right back. But I think there is a sense that we all experience this. We all experience this wasting away. And that's in the middle of a world that is trying to tell us to f feed ourselves, to please ourselves, to seek our own ends. We're constantly surrounded by a world that is telling us to pursue sinful ends, to pursue sinful enjoyment, to pursue selfishness, to pursue what makes us happy, what pleases us. And that's something that is true both for you guys that are in middle school, for your leaders, for your parents, for everyone. We live in a world that is predicated around this constant messaging of choosing yourself, about having autonomy. What do you want to do? And that's what you ought to then do. And yet, we find this contrast, this challenge in Scripture. Um, and Charlie even talked about it some last night, this fear of um, God's punishment causing us to be obedient to Christ and to follow Christ. There is going to be a difficulty in this life when we choose that path. When we choose the path of resistance. When we choose the path of being like Christ. We are going to meet a lot of headwinds. We are going to meet a lot of challenges and difficulties in this life. Because the world is going to tell you, you are missing out. That you are choosing the lesser things. That you are choosing things that don't make sense. It doesn't make sense to choose to deny yourself and to take up your cross and follow Christ. It doesn't make sense to say no to the desires that you have. When you have a desire, you ought to fulfill it, the world says. And yet as Christians, we recognize that we have sinful desires, we have flesh, and we have bodies that are working against the gospel, working against what Christ has called us to. And so we have this battle going on between our inner selves, for those of us who are in Christ, where we are being renewed by Christ, and we are a new creation in Christ, versus our outer selves, our flesh, our body, and the world that is trying to call us towards following the world. Um, that is working against what Christ has called us to do. Um, this is something that Paul talks about in Romans 7, this battle between uh, what he wants to do in his spirit because of what he is in Christ versus what the world is calling to do, what his flesh ends up leading him towards in sin. And we have this constant messaging that we are missing out, that we are missing out on something. And so I've called the message today, No Fear, FOMO, Fear of Missing Out. Um, I know we all have lots of fears. Some of them are fear of death, fear of heights, um, guilty. 
Um, fear of public speaking, not guilty, um, which is good. Here I am. Um, but w- I think one of the fears that we experience in this world and more in the p- present age is that fear of missing out, that we see others and we see them enjoying something and we think, I want that. Why, I wish I was part of that. I don't want to miss this thing. I see it on Instagram. I see it on TikTok. I want to participate. I want to enjoy that. I want to be part of that. And we're afraid that we're missing out on something. And the world is going to tell us that as Christians that are behaving as Christ has called us to, living a holy life in this world as God has called us to, that we're missing out on something. And that our outer selves, our physical selves, are actually wasting away. That we're losing out on something. And so I want to turn with you, or have you guys turn with me, to 2 Corinthians. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And here we have Paul, who is commending himself to the Corinthians and commending this message um, that our outer selves are these jars of clay, as he puts it. Um, And yet inside of us is the message and the hope of the gospel that is glorious, that is a surpassing power and treasure within us. Um, So our passage today is 2 Corinthians 4, 16 to 18, but I'd like to get a running start, um, like I do with tubing. Um, So we'll start in verse 7. Paul writes to the Corinthians, But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not driven to despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life in you. Since we have the same spirit of faith according to what has been written, I believed, and so I spoke. We also believe, and so we also speak. Knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will also raise us, will raise us also with Jesus and bring us with you into his presence. For it is all for your sake, that's so that as grace extends to more and more people, it may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. In our passage for today, So we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. And so guys, if we are going to follow Christ, We have to let our outer selves waste away. Not just in the sense that you get older and your body starts to break down. Um, That is beyond your control, regardless of what you choose. But what we really have to do is we have to choose... Let's see if that helps. There. I won't move. Um, What we have to choose is to also let those desires, those worldly desires, the desires of the flesh, also waste away. We have a world that is going to tell us that we need to seek ourselves and our own desires. We have a world that's going to tell us to seek pleasure wherever it may be found, where we choose to please ourselves, to meet the desires that we have. We have a world that's going to tell us that whatever you want to do as far as sexual immorality is concerned, it's not immoral. Just choose what you want, pursue that desire, meet that desire in whatever way you can, in whatever way you feel like. We have a world that's telling us to party and to live it up, and to enjoy life as much as you possibly can. We have a world that tells us to pursue as much money for your own ends as it possible. To be greedy, to work. It says we have Hollywood that has championed the phrase, greed is good. Uh, we have a world that tells us to gossip, to tear down. If that's the way you can build yourself up by tearing others down, go for it. Do that. We have a world that says to those who don't live it, hey, you're missing out. Like, look how much fun I'm having. See this life that I'm living. 
see this life that I'm proclaiming on Instagram or on TikTok, on social media, or at school saying, look how cool I am because I'm doing these things. And you, you're lame because you're not. You're not enjoying these things. You're not choosing to pursue your own desires. You're giving stuff up for others. You're seeking to put others' interests first. That's foolish. Why would you ever choose to do that? We live in a world that says that if we do not seek to please ourselves, we are missing out. That is what the world is going to scream at us as loud as it possibly can. Because that is all that the world knows. It goes back to the beginning in the garden when they say, Eve, eat this fruit because it will give you knowledge. I mean, don't you want to have that? Why are you missing out? You're missing out on the knowledge of good and evil. You don't want to miss out on that. Take a bite. What could go wrong? <laughs> Spoiler alert. A lot. A lot can go wrong. Uh, we have a whole lot of issues that go on that have, can go wrong because of that. Can I get the handheld? Yeah. No. There should be a handheld mic in front of the water bottle. Yeah. Okay. Ooh, I'm on nine, and I'm really loud. <laughs> and so, as we look to what this world says, we instead need to look and see what Christ says. That we do not lose heart, though our outer self is wasting away. We actually need to, instead of pursuing our worldly desires, instead of pursuing what the flesh wants. Instead of pursuing the things that our mortal flesh desires, we instead need to die to them daily. We need to actually put those to death. That the way to truly live is to die. And so for point number one, put it down this way, die to worldly desires daily. Die to worldly desires daily. And this is going to be a daily fight. For those who are in Christ, this is a battle that begins when you become a Christian and it ends when you die or Christ calls you home at the rapture. It is a daily fight to fight against our flesh, to fight against the world, and to fight against Satan. We are going to face temptation each and every day to choose our own selves, to choose our own path, to choose our own wants. And instead, we need to die to ourselves each and every day. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 16. Look at some of what Jesus said in his call to his disciples. Matthew chapter 16. This is the calling that Jesus has placed on each and every one of us as believers. If we are going to call ourselves Christian, if we are going to follow Christ, if we have placed our faith in Christ and repented of our sins, this is the calling that we have, which is this. Jesus says, starting in verse 24 of chapter 16, then Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come with angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay each person according to what he has done. And so the calling that Christ places on those who are going to follow him, those who are going to come after him, is to take up the Roman execution rack on which Jesus himself was killed and to carry it daily, that we are called to die each and every day to our worldly desires. When you wake up in the morning, you are in the midst of a war. And it is not with flesh and blood. It's with your own flesh and your own blood. It is with yourself and your selfish wants. It's with a world that is going to proclaim to you that you are missing out. If you aren't looking at porn, then you're missing out. If you're not doing drugs, you're missing out on all the fun. If you're not drinking, what are you even doing? 
That is what the world is going to tell you each and every day in every means in every way that it can possibly do. It is going to proclaim it on social media. It's going to proclaim it in your schools. It's going to proclaim it at the park. You are going to run into people each and every day that say, if you don't pursue these things, if you're not looking to build yourself up and to tear others down, if you're not seeking to find your identity and what people think of you, if your identity is not tied up in the number of likes you're getting on Instagram or the number of views you're getting on TikTok, then what are you even doing? What even is the point? That is what the world is going to tell you, that you are missing out because you're not participating in these things. And yet, Christ says, no, no, no. Actually deny yourself. Deny that hit of endorphin of trying to get likes and trying to get praise from the world by following the world's ways. The world is going to clamor that you're missing out. It's going to make as much noise as possible. Please yourself. Satisfy your, your desires. You do you. If you have a desire, meet it. Unmet, unfulfilled desires are evil. I went to a small private Christian school and was fairly sheltered throughout uh, my middle school years, and yet got to high school and started playing on the football team. Um, and suddenly there were these rumors of worldly joys and worldly desires being met by my teammates. Um, that was all that they talked about in the locker room. And there was a sense of like, am I missing out? They seem to be having a lot of fun. They seem to talk about these things really highly. It sounds like they're actually having a great time. I think I enjoy what I'm doing. I think I enjoy this life as a Christian, but wow, they really do sound like they're having a fun time. Partying, drinking, all those things. And then I got to college and I joined the rugby team. And I got to see that lifestyle up close and personal. And it was the emptiest thing I've ever seen. No better apologetic against that lifestyle than seeing those guys and the way they lived their life um, and how absolutely miserable they were despite the face that they put. They said, I'm having the best time of my life. I'm having such a great time. I love this lifestyle. And then, like, we got alone. We got some time in the hotel room after a rugby match. Man, this is the emptiest thing I've ever seen. There's no end in that. That end is destruction. There is nothing to that. The world is saying you're missing out if you're not joining in in this lifestyle. What a lie. That's just a, it's just a joke. It's not true. The world says it and proclaims it and screams it as loud as it can, hoping to drown out the inner voice inside themselves that this is actually empty and this actually is not meaningful and this actually isn't going anywhere. This really does just feel like death. And so learn to die to those desires yourself in Christ. Because that way that the world is telling you to go, it really is empty. It really does lead to destruction. It has no meaning. It has no purpose. It has no true satisfying joy. You're constantly chasing the next thing. You're constantly looking for the next thing to fulfill you, to meet that need, that gnawing desire within you. That is what the world is actually leading you towards. It's something that is completely empty, completely meaningless, completely purposeless, and that only leads to your destruction and the destruction of those around you. It is completely, utterly empty. If those guys on the rugby team told me, you're missing out, man, oh, what a lie from the devil. Like, that is a lie from the pit of hell. And it was something that, as they saw the way I lived, it crystallized to them. It crystallized for some of those guys how empty and meaningless and purposeless their lives truly were. That in seeking to please themselves and please themselves only, there was nothing to that. It was a miserable way to go through life. The world does not want you to believe that delayed gratification actually pays off. And yet, when we choose to deny ourselves each and every day and pursue Christ, when we choose to deny ourselves, when we choose to die to worldly desires, we actually find that that really is the way to life. Like, it's amazing that the God who created us, who knit us in our parents, in our mother's womb, who knows the most intimate details about us, it's amazing that he actually knows the way we ought to live. He actually understands the way to life because he's the one that made us and created us and formed us and shaped us. And he says that when we truly deny ourselves, when we actually look out 
to others' interests, when we actually are obedient to Christ instead of pursuing sinfulness and selfishness, that there is richness and life there. That that is how we find the way to have meaning and purpose and life and joy in this life because it's the way God created us to be in this world. Jesus also says in Matthew 10, 28, and Charlie talked on this last night, do not fear those who can kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather fear him who can destroy both the soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. But even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore, you are of much more value than any sparrows. So everyone who acknowledges me before men, I also will acknowledge before my father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I also will deny before my Father who is in heaven. That this ultimately, that path that the world is trying to get you to live on, that path that the world wants you to walk down, is the one that leads towards that fearful punishment and wrath that Charlie talked about last night. It's the path that leads towards eternal destruction. And so I don't know if you guys need to, like what it is that you need to kill But this is something that you actually need to actually work against and fight against. That you need to die to these desires in yourself and you need to actively kill them as well. Christ says in Matthew 5, 27, he says specifically, you have heard that it was said you shall not commit adultery, but I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. If your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go into hell. If you find that social media is an avenue for you to be tempted and to go into sin, then kill it. Get rid of it. Don't dabble in it. Get rid of it. It's not worth it. If you find that these friends that you kind of like, but they also are leading you in a different direction than you should go, stop hanging out with them. If you find that this group that you're in is also tempting you to pursue sinful desires, stop. Like, stop hanging out with them. It's not something to dabble in, spend a little bit of time, like, well, I'll just hang out with them, like, a little bit less. You know, I I really like hanging out with her. She's really cool. She kind of wants me to party and do these things. But, like, uh, you know, she's, she's fun. No, stop. Stop hanging out with those people. Stop spending time with those people. Because they are going to lead you on the path of destruction. That we do not want to go in any half measures in this. Like, that is what Christ is saying here in Matthew 5. It's not take half measures. If this is causing you to sin, get rid of it. If a smartphone is an avenue for temptation and sin, then get rid of it. Get a dumb phone. Find a flip phone. And if your friends make fun of you, that is the noise of the devil trying to lead you astray towards death. Let us be made fun of and mocked for having a dumb phone than to go to hell with a smartphone. Like that is what Christ is saying. Like if your your computer, if your time on your iPad, if these friends that you're hanging out with, if that is leading you astray, cut it out. C.S. Lewis in his book, The Great Divorce, talks about a man who had this black lizard of lust on him. And an angel comes up and says, let me kill it. And he's like, whoa, whoa. Like, I want to get rid of it. But like, I don't, I don't know about killing it seems like a lot. Like, please, like, this is going to, like, you know. It's this thing that's slowly crawling around and eating him and devouring him and weakening his soul. And the angel's like, let me kill it. And he's like, well, that seems like a bit strong. Like, that's, I mean, could we just... I just, I don't know. And finally, he gets to the point where he says, okay, you can kill it. And it dies. And it's the angel kills it. And suddenly, he comes back to life. And suddenly, he rides off into heaven where this thing that was killing him was slowly choking him out, was slowly putting him to death. When he finally was willing to kill it, that is when he found life. I don't know if it's video games. I don't know if it's technology. I don't know if it's friends. I don't know what it is. 
But if there is things in your life that are causing you to sin, then get away. Run away. Find a new group of friends. Find new people to hang out with. It's part of the reason we want you to be find friends here that love the Lord. So that you have people who aren't saying, hey, why don't you start doing these things that are sinful? But are saying, hey, why don't you start doing these things that are obedient to Christ? Guys, this is hard. And it is going to feel like in the moment, cutting those things off, that it's death. I mean, Jesus was extreme, saying, pluck out your eye, cut off your hand. But those are the measures that we need to take. Don't take half measures and think that it will solve anything. Our allowances for the devil are strongholds that he will hold on to and he will dig into and he will set down deep roots and use those as opportunities to destroy your life because he loves nothing better than for you to take a half measure and him to do a false retreat, to step back a little bit, to make you think, well, I, you know, I killed this much of it, so I'm okay. And then suddenly you find yourself weeks later and it's like he's done even worse. He's found new avenues and new places that he is taking hold in your life. This is the death aside of the equation. This is the wasting away. But that is our outer selves. And there is a contrast. There's a contrast throughout this passage. That the outer self is wasting away. But the inner self is being renewed day by day. The outer self, the things that we're letting die, that is light and momentary affliction. The things going on in here, the things of Christ, that is eternal weight of glory beyond comparison. We're not going to look to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that we see, the things that the world is going to champion, they're transient, they're passing away, they're fleeting. The things of God, they are eternal. They last forever a really long time. And so the positive side is that if you are in Christ, though your outer self may feel like it's wasting away, though it may feel like death to say no to these things, to get rid of these things that seem fun but are also avenues of temptation and sin, inside, with Christ, through the Holy Spirit, we are renewed day by day. The inside is spiritual. The inside is the things of God. And so while we are going to die to worldly desires daily, we are also, for point two, put it down, we're going to be refueled by God daily. Be refueled by God daily. Each day we are dying to sin. We are dying to selfishness. We are dying to our own desires, our own sinful and selfish desires. Each day we're actively killing those things in our life that are sinful. And that's a lot of death that it's going to feel like. But that's not the whole story, and it's not even half of the story. It's not like 50% death and 50% life, so here we are in this middle blase on we. No, 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 no. The things of death are light and momentary and small, and the things of God are eternally weighty and glorious beyond comparison. For Christians, our life and our joy, it comes not from the fleeting things of this world. It comes from Christ. It comes from being with Christ forever. The promise of having the Holy Spirit within you when you give your life to Christ is the promise of a living water, of a wellspring of living water within you that is constantly bubbling up that is constantly refueling you, refilling you, that's constantly providing that life and that strength and that joy because it's within you. It's not, it's not affected necessarily by the out outer things, the external things, the external circumstances. It's what's going on inside. That is the promise that Christ offers to us in the Holy Spirit, is a wellspring of living water that will refuel us and renew us day by day. The image jo Jesus gives in John 15 is that of Jesus being the vine and us being the branches, and that we are obedient to Christ. When we follow Christ, we are abiding in the vine. We're remaining attached to the vine. And when we're, we're attached to the vine, we're attached to life itself. 
vine branches that are snipped off don't produce fruit. They wither and die and become fuel for the fire. But when the branch is attached to the vine, when the branch is attached to the trunk of the tree, then it's drawing up from the tree life. And it's able to produce rich fruit. And so, guys, that looks like being obedient to Christ. It looks like obeying his commands. I mean, that is specifically what Jesus says in John 15. He who obeys my commands is the one that abides in me. So if we want to abide in Christ, it looks like being obedient to Christ. It looks like doing what Christ says. It also looks like reading the word, that this is where we get life. It's by being in God's word. It is a feast for our souls. God's word is a feast for our souls. I like to eat. I enjoy good food. My soul loves the word. And I clearly don't deny myself a lot of food. I enjoy eating the chocolate that my wife hides throughout the house as I seek it and find it. Um, let us search much easier. God's not trying to hide the chocolate and the joy in his word. It is there for us to find each and every day. Let us do that, not as a chore, not as a hardship, but as a joy, that there is pure joy of obedience to God. Guys, the chief end of man is to know God and to enjoy him forever. I'm a Star Wars nerd. I enjoyed watching the book of Boba Fett. I don't know if you guys watched the show, um, but the Bacta tank that Boba would spend his time in it filled up with water as he sat there with a oxygen regulator um, from a scuba tank. Um, I also enjoy scuba diving, so two loves right there, all in one. Um, but that is almost the idea of how we are immersed in God. It is this overwhelming, enveloping thing. The living, of water, living water of God enveloping us in that. That as the world is going to try to erode us, constantly telling us that we're missing out on these good things that the world has to offer, and it's kind of trying to dry us out to remove any life from us, to remove any joy from us, that inside of us is this wellspring of water. We're not drawing on something external and hoping to find the next river where we can find water. Like We ourselves bring it with us everywhere we go. That through the Holy Spirit dwelling within us, we have this living water that is constantly welling up in us. We are an oasis in the midst of the desert. We're the oasis of joy that those who are in this broken world, who are pursuing the dead things of this world, that they need. We are the great apologetic of the Christian life because we are filled with the joy that transcends circumstances. A joy, despite not doing the things that the world thinks, provide joy. The world claims provides joy, even though it knows end up being empty. We are not wasting away because we see that the circumstances of this world cannot erode the hope and the joy and the strength we have in Christ. So guys, spend time in his word. Daily feast on the feast that's presented to you. And if yesterday was a famine because you neglected it, then don't let yesterday's famine keep you from today's feast. Get in the word today. Spend time reading it today. Let today be the day you're in the Word. Spend time with God today. Spend time in prayer, communing with the God of the universe. Communing with the one who has provided you this eternal wellspring of life through the Holy Spirit. Commune with the one who is that wellspring of life, the Holy Spirit himself. The world says, value these things, these temporary highs and joys that are fleeting and are meaningless and are empty, that lead to death and that lead to shame, that lead to depression, lead to emptiness. God's word corrects our view, corrects the way we see them. We actually can recognize them for what they are, transient and meaningless and empty, vanity of vanities as we've been learning in Ecclesiastes. As we spend time in God's word, it starts to elevate our perspective. It starts to remind us of what the whole story is. That we get outside of this small little box of our lives 
and the world's yelling at us and we're beat down and we're surrounded and we get in the word and we zoom out. And suddenly what seems impossible and what seems so dark and hard and challenging, we zoom out and we see the end of the story. We see what happens in the end. We know that Christ is returning and Christ will reign forever. And those who are in Christ will rise to life with him and be united with him forever. And so as we spend time in the word, it helps us have the right perspective on the things of this world. It elevates our perspective. It helps us to look forward, not to just the days of this life in this world, but it helps to, for point number three, look forward to eternal days. Look forward to eternal days. That while each and every day we are dying to ourselves and each and every day we are renewed by the word of God and by God's Holy Spirit dwelling within us and by prayer and obedience to Christ, we also look forward beyond today, beyond tomorrow, to eternity with Christ. And suddenly, everything starts to make sense. The reason we can die to these temporal things today is because it is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory with Christ that is beyond comparison. How does Paul go through all of the afflictions that he faces? I mean, this is Paul calling us to follow his example. That he says we are afflicted in every way, but we're not crushed. We're perplexed. We don't know what's going on in the moment, but we're not driven to despair. But we don't understand the here and now, the immediate moment, and the reason for our circumstances and the way they are. We aren't driven to despair because we understand the end of the story. We understand where it is all leading. We know that it is these momentary current afflictions are preparing us for Christ. They're preparing for us a reward with Christ in heaven. That we are, we may be struck, we may be persecuted, we may be mocked. I mean, if we make the decision to actually put to death, to get rid of these avenues of temptation, whether it be social media or smartphones or technology or groups of friends, we will be mocked for that. We will be made fun of. People will look at us like we're weird and strange and different without any comprehension of why we would make that, de that decision. But we're not forsaken. We may be forsaken by those friends who do not understand the decision we're making. We may be forsaken by those people around us that are choosing to follow the world and its desires. But we're not forsaken by God. In fact, Christ is near to us. The Holy Spirit is dwelling within us. We're not left alone. We may be struck down. I mean, Paul, that was a literal op like pos possibility, was being killed. But he's not fearing the man who can kill the body, but after that can do nothing to his soul. Paul, in a different letter to the letter of the Philippians, says, for me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. That it is far better for him to depart and be united with Christ. That as far as he would have it, let the world take me and usher me into the presence of Christ. Like, we are not destroyed if that is what the world chooses to do. We are, in fact, now made even more alive because we are united with Christ in eternity. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. That we may carry around in our bodies the death of Jesus, but in doing so, the life of Jesus is manifested in our bodies. That when we choose to die to these worldly desires, we are actually manifesting the life of Christ in us. We are proclaiming the truth of the gospel when we choose these things because we say that our hope is not in this life. It is not in this world. It is in eternity. The sacrifice of these things is preparing an eternal benefit for us. If our eyes are fixed on this world, the suffering and the loss and the death that we experience will be overwhelming and it will be meaningless. Because why are we giving up these things that we want and desire for not having them? But if our eyes are fixed on Christ, 
we start to see the eternal reward, the eternal joy that comes from doing so. That these sufferings are things that are actually shaping us to be more like Christ. And suddenly, what seems to be death from a worldly perspective is the thing that is leading to more life because we're starting to shave off the sinfulness. We're chiseling away at the brokenness in our lives and the things that take us away from Christ and make us look not like Christ and suddenly are becoming more like him, more like the one in whom our soul and our hearts delight. I mean, Paul talks about um, in, later on in 2 Corinthians, in, verse, in chapter 11, he shares his own story, the things that he's experienced for the sake of the gospel. I mean, this is a man who's not talking about this in any sort of theoretical sense. This is a man who is going through it, who has been in the middle of it. He's saying, are they servants of Christ? I am a better one. I'm talking like a madman with far greater labors, far more imprisonments, with countless beatings, and often near death. Five times I received at the hands of the Jews the 40 lashes less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea, on frequent journeys in danger from rivers, dangers from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers, in toil and hardship, through many a sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, often without food and cold and exposure. And apart from other things, there is the daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches. Who is weak and I am not weak? Who is made to fall and I am not indignant? I mean, this is the example of Paul in his life. He's been beaten. He's been stoned. He's been shipwrecked all for the sake of the gospel. I mean, what foolishness from a worldly perspective. Why are you continuing to do this? Why are you pressing on? He's pressing on for the glory of Christ because his eyes are not fixed on this world. They're fixed on eternity with Christ and the eternal glory he will enjoy with him. Paul presses on, casting aside these things so that he can be with Christ. His eyes are fixed on Christ. His eyes are fixed on heaven. C.S. Lewis commenting in his essay that talks about this passage, our passage for today, 2 Corinthians 4, 16 through 18, he talks about how we as people in this world, we as Christians, it's not that we have too great of desires. It's actually that our desires are too small. That our problem is that we desire these transient things, these things that are actually meaningless, that are just a breath, they're a mist, and they're fading away. Our desires are too small. He describes it that we are like a child content to sit in the backyard and making mud pies. That, that is what we're choosing to do when we are choosing the things of the world. God is offering to us, as C.S. Lewis puts it, a vacation, a holiday by the sea. Or, for those of us maybe in this world, holiday at Disney World. Like we're content to sit in the back and roll around in the mud in the backyard with these things of the world. When what we are offered is Disneyland, land, is Disney World, is going through Star Wars land and enjoying this great joy. Or pick some other vacation, going to the Galapagos Islands on a sailboat, island hopping for weeks, except for eternity. Like that is what Christ is offering. He's saying that we are desiring and seeking these small, tiny, meaningless things when he is offering to us something of eternal glory, eternal weight, eternal joy. Stop settling for less. Stop settling for the things that the world is selling you because it's meaningless and purposeless and leads only to death and destruction, to shame. Seek the things that are above that are far more glorious. Let's turn finally to the end of the story. It's always a good reminder. When we're trying to look forward to eternal days, to read from God's word about those eternal days. Revelation 21. Right here at the end of the story. A story that is both written and yet to be written. That we're looking forward to this story that is sure to come, that we wait for, not as an uncertain hope, but a certain hope that we know is coming. Revelation 
21, starting in verse 3. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. And he, God, who is seated on the throne, said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also, he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. We know that this is the end of the story. This is what we are looking forward to. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have this heritage, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But heed this warning. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, so sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. The end of the story is known. It is certain. Your call is to now, in this life, to die to yourself before you die. It's the only hope you have. After you die, it is too late. To paraphrase Jesus' words from the Gospel of Matthew, do not fear missing out on worldly pleasures that fade away. Fear missing out on eternal pleasures that will never end as you suffer eternally. That is the choice we have to make. That is the thing to fear missing out on, is the eternal pleasures of God. Do not choose the light and the momentary and the transient things of this world that only lead to death and separation from God. Choose obedience to Christ. Choose a life in Him. And look forward to that day where we will enjoy eternal glory and pleasure with Christ forever. Let me pray. God, I thank you for the hope that we have. That God, our hope is not in this life. Though we face trouble and hardship trying circumstances, God, that we may, be, we may be called to cut out things in our life that seem as big as cutting out our hand or our eye. That, God, we giving these things up may feel like death, but, God, we are renewed by your Holy Spirit within us. And, God, this light and momentary affliction, this suffering in this present age, God, it is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory that is beyond comparison, that's beyond comprehension for us, God, in our finite minds, that we will be with the Lord and enjoy him forever. What a joyous end to the story, God. And thank you, God, that we know and are certain that it is certain. You have said that it is done, that this is the end to the story. And so, God, I pray for these students that they would choose life, they would choose Christ, they would choose that which lasts forever and not the things that the world is selling, the things that are transient, that are fading away, that are here today and gone tomorrow. God, may they, not, may they not be deceived by the world's lies that say these are the things that bring joy and meaning and purpose and life. God, may we see through them and see the death and the destruction that those things lead to the emptiness behind all of it, God. And may we instead fix our eyes on Christ. May we fix our eyes on the one who died for us, who died for our sins, to take the ultimate punishment that we deserve and gave us his righteousness and his life, that we might enjoy him forever, that we might be united to him for all eternity. Praise God, from whom all blessings flow, Lord. I pray now as we worship you, that we would worship you, God. May our hearts 
and our eyes be drawn to the one, to the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the one who is on the throne, who is on the throne for all eternity. May our eyes be drawn to him, and may our hearts and our minds worship him. We lift this up to you in the precious and holy name of Jesus. Amen.